Today, we're talking about a topic that's been in the news a lot lately, mental health. Mental health crisis. Mental health crisis. Decline. A mental health crisis. Addiction. Drug use. A mental health crisis. Obesity. A mental health crisis. Alcoholism. Mental health crisis. Gun violence. A mental health crisis. Opioid epidemic. Mental health crisis. Boston, Massachusetts. Three years after the beginning of the COVID-19 lockdowns, I found myself in a brand new reality of a world around me plagued with a mental health crisis. As I watched the country around me struggle with substance abuse, violence, and other mental health related problems, I couldn't help but ask myself what the spiritual causes of this crisis could be. To look at this crisis from a spiritual perspective, I sat down with Buddhist monks Tengyur Rinpoche and Dorje Dolma to learn about how living in America has impacted their spirituality and how us Americans may be able to navigate the mental health crisis from a Buddhist perspective. Tengyur and Dorje are both from the Himalayan mountains of northern India and have come to study at the Harvard Divinity School here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. My name is Tengu Rinpoche. Uh, I'm born in a small town in the northeastern part of India, near Bhutan, called Tawang. Uh, it's a very beautiful town with the old Tibetan Buddhist community. And then I came to southern part of India, a monastery called Sarajaya Monastery, where I study and finish my monastic studies. My name is Dorje Rola and I'm from Ladakh. Um, Ladakh is northern part of India, um, so it's the Himalayan region. Yeah, so I'm from there. So my, my own father was a monk in an important monastery in Tibet called Tapu Monastery. He also later became a monk in Sera Monastery. So he used to go and come, he used to go and come. So nowadays, uh, since we came under the independent India and in Tibet, the culture preservations of Tibetan Buddhism and culture in particular becomes such a difficult point uh, of extinction with Chinese influence growing day in day out. So places like my hometown and all the range of Himalaya becomes very important when it comes to preservation of Tibetan culture, language. And so uh, the Tibetan exile community in, uh, in, in India and all around the world were very fewer in number. They do not have uh, their own freedom uh, in terms of their own land or any authority to preserve. So. Our hometowns becomes kind of a very important role in preserving the Tibetan culture and language and religion within staying in India. So this is the, <clears throat> the importance of my hometown from the religious point of view. But logistically, it's located in a very remote place from India. And uh, for example, if I have to travel from Boston to my hometown, of course, I have to fly to Delhi and from Delhi to another, I have to take a domestic flight for two to three hours to another state called Guwahati in Assam, which is further down to the northeast. And from there, I have to go by car for almost two days through the Himalayan mountain terrains. And so we have to cross huge mountain peaks. So logistically, it's uh, located in a very difficult road. So therefore, the, the prosperity of economics and all tourism becomes a challenge which are the only source of our income, is the only source of income is tourism at this moment. Um, I've heard of America like when I was in high school and there was this um, lady, um, she was American and then she told us that okay in America things are really different and when they, uh, when they get like 18 years old their parents would kick them out from house and then tell them to maybe survive on their own and that was like really um, 
it hit me in, really in a different way because like in our place in our uh, culture it's even even you get like maybe if you are like 30 40 years old you are still living with your parents and it's so normal and that that is not only one way it's the both way even parents stay with live with their kids when they're old um and that that aspect for me was something that is unimaginable because like, i thought that how could parents kick out <laughs> their kids and how a kid could uh, kick out their parents when they get old but after coming here um i would say that that may not be like that it's not necessarily the case on a personal level in america and also in the western what i find is that there is less person to person on individual level engagement so uh, that is something that we need to work on and when you have a certain things happening in your mind uh, be it bullying or abuse or any kind of things you need to find a really someone who you can confide in and share those things sharing your uh, problems really lessen the burden so here the compassionate practice such as compassionate listening becomes so important. So when you share your problems, uh, you feel a little bit lighter. But if the problem is something that you can really find a solution to, then you should go for the solution rather than worrying about the problem. It's like in our place back then, it's more about slow, like uh, slow in, in any every sense. But here it's um, it's like I also am trying to go with the flow um, it's it's not that like only certain area is uh, first phase it's just the society itself and you need to try like move on with it um, so that that is the one aspect that a bit challenging for me to adapt with it mindfulness and the spiritual practice is not really actually the way the Lord Buddha taught that is not really designed for a specific place or a specific lifestyle for example when you are really living in a very quiet place in the mountainous region then you practice mindfulness but when you move to a city life then you do not practice that is not the case in my my understanding it's not like spiritual life is different and then our day-to-day -day life is different it's it's not two different things are both the spiritual life and the day-to-day -day life like whatever regular life that we have has to be combined uh, and we have to make it one instead of making it two or different life so my spiritual life is this and my day-to-day um, -day life is this and when i get into the zone of spiritual life i only practice spirituality and when it, when i come out from it then my spirituality does not work so that i think that, that's not about spirituality. I, I won't say that spirituality. Spirituality is more about like whatever you practice in maybe in general life, whatever chanting you do, whatever it is. It also has to adapt with the with the day-to-day -day life, and in that sense, it won't affect the the, the first phase. Won't affect the spiritual um, practice of an of an individual. In the West, in modern context, we call it mental health issues. We use different terms like depression, stress, and so and so on. In traditional Buddhist settings, they are used to uh, identify with a different terminology called mental afflictions. So at the end of the day, these two are the same thing. So Shantideva and those masters uh, identified that there are three poisons he identified. So three poisons which he termed that as root of all the sufferings that we go into uh, in this life. The three poisons he identified, uh, the first as an aversion or anger, and then uh, second, the desire or, or attachment, and these two as the two more evident form of uh, agitations or aversion as the two afflictions, mental afflictions that disturbs our mind. And the third one is ignorance. So now, the ignorance, what Shantideva meant by ignorance is that we are ignored or we are really in dark about the situation that we are in or finding the solution. For example, when you say that people commit suicide out of depression, we do understand that nobody commits suicide until they are really 
forced into a very difficult situations. So that was the, their last step, last alternative that one finds in life, then they commit suicide. But Chandideva says that because we are ignored or we are in darkness about the other options that we can deal even before we reach such a state. So ignorance here referring to not understanding the situations that really make us uh, cause suffering in this way. I think it's um, at least how I understood is the, the mental crisis or the, the um, effects from the outer crisis are something that is not only happening in the West, it is everywhere I would say um, and it's, it's something that is normal in a uh, human being. Um, say for instance now or the war is going on considering the war is like maybe it's real Ukraine all this are um, that kind of crisis contributes to individual even if you're not connected with maybe um, like Israel or maybe Palestine, but still it affects you, it affects your mental, mental health. Um, but at the same time, the practices that um, is in the Buddhism, say for instance, maybe practicing loving kindness, maybe compassion, all those would, I think, but the practice has to be from the beginning. One, one have to be practicing like regularly, um, like constantly and then the the result of that practice would uh, bring the fruits when we fix this kind of difficulties otherwise it's more about i think nowadays mostly when i see mm, people facing problems like okay i'm not i i feel like i'm maybe in depression uh, my mental health is not really well then we would be like oh practice meditation practice mindfulness i think that doesn't really work because like practice is the mindfulness practice is not something that when you face problem and then you started to practice mindfulness it has to do it has to be something that you practice it every day um, maybe from the beginning whatever beginning makes sense to you like maybe today and then when you get certain kind of problems when you face with this kind of situation then uh, there would be face that you can deal it with yeah deal with it nicely or maybe however so we do not even need to attribute these teachings to Buddhism or any other teachers. We can bring the wholesome practice that is there and then make it into a therapy or maybe into a module and then accessible to, to everyone. So here the important thing is one, one shortcoming that I see sometimes in many countries, especially in the West, is that people do not want to do anything that has something to do with religion. We should remember always that there is a lot of good things in the religion that has nothing to do with the religion part itself. So by ignoring, by distancing yourself from a religion and without getting any benefit to good things that are present in that religion, it's a really a big disadvantage. As I concluded my time with Tengir and Dorje, I came out not with the answers I expected, but the answers which challenged me to rethink the entire notion that America is experiencing an isolated situation with its mental health crisis. The truth is people all over the world are struggling with their mental health in the wake of COVID-19 and the global wars. It is nothing special to America, but the key is learning how to protect your own mental health in the first place. You can't just embrace mindfulness once you enter a bad situation, but instead one must build a solid foundation from day to day so that we have the strength to take on these hurdles when they arise. And a lack of this strength may be the result of a country out of touch with its religion and spirituality, but it takes every one of us to put in the work and build a foundation which is stronger than ever.